I hope that everybody's enjoying their dinner. I'm seeing a lot of lively conversation, which is fantastic. And I am very thrilled to introduce our fireside chat speakers today, uh, Professor Marianne Bertrand and Dan Gorenstein. Marianne Bertrand is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. She is also the co-chair of J-PAL's labor sector. And Dan Gorenstein is the founder and executive editor of Trade Offs. And today, we'll be hearing from them about what works to reduce poverty, a fireside chat. So Dan and Marianne, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, really appreciate it. Um, thanks everybody. It's fun to be the dinner entertainment. Uh -huh. Do you have any jokes that you can tell? I have very low on jokes. <laughs> um, hopefully you guys enjoy your meals. The point of this conversation is to help everybody in the room. I think uh, this might lower the energy level. I don't mean to, to, to do this too much, but to really think about and talk about evidence and data as it pertains to poverty and what we have uh, learned, what assumptions we've made when Marianne began her career as a professor, and how the evidence and data has shifted that thinking over time. And obviously, we're going to be talking about poverty, but I'm sure lots of people in this room have topics that they're really interested in. And it seems to me, as a humble reporter, that whatever the topic is, it's the evidence and data that can help change how we begin to think and the questions that we ask. So with that said, let's dive in. And uh, again, thank you all for having us. So Marianne, when you began your career, what was the consensus understanding of how to solve poverty? OK. It's a great question. Um, so I, should, I, I want to start by saying that it's, it's kind of a, I, I told you this before, Dan, is like, it's very awkward for me to be like on the stage talking about poverty because I'm far from an expert on poverty. So I'll start with that. Uh, and I, I'm going to try to, but still I spend some time kind of thinking about this question. So I started grad school exactly 30 years ago. Um, and it was interesting, you know, kind of in preparation of this to try to reflect on what I feel like, you know, kind of we've learned. Uh, what is different in terms of the way we think about poverty today uh, compared to back in the days. So I'm, I'm a labor economist, you know, kind of mainly by training. And in many ways, when I think about the labor angle to poverty, I would say that things have not changed that much. You know, kind of, I was in grad school, again, in the mid-1990s, and we were talking about the fact that in order to do well in the U.S., you needed to have a college degree. And if you didn't get a college degree, things were going to be kind of much rougher, even worse if you did not you know, complete high school. I think that remains very much true today. The forces that are behind that you know, have some of the same you know, technology. We're probably talking much more about globalization today than we used to in the days. But at the core, when it comes to the labor market, I think we're still at that moment where in order to escape poverty in the US, you better get more than just you know, a high school degree, at least uh, try to finish high school. And when it comes to you know, kind of, do we know more about what to do with this kind of labor market, we still have the same issues, which is that there's returns to education, there's not enough people going to college, and how do we fix that? And that ties back to you know, kind of the conversation that we had earlier today, you know, kind of the conversation about tutoring programs. What can we do to make sure that, you know, kind of many more young people that may not be, you know, kind of in families with lots of resources do finish high school tutoring. So I think we're making progress thanks to a lot of the RCTs that people in this room have been working on, the work that Gustavo has been doing as well, trying to make sure that people get a chance to, you know, kind of push the education, you know, forward. And then the other solutions are more the kind of stuff that Larry has talked about, which is that to the extent that you are dealing with people that don't have that education, how do you prepare them for higher quality jobs than the jobs that are typically available for people that you know, kind of don't have the schooling? And, and there, it's kind of a mixed bag. And I think Larry did a really good job kind of summarizing that. We've had a lot of very frustrating kind of research on you know, kind of training programs and finding them not to work you know, very well. And you know, kind of, there are some other kind of more success stories, like you know, the sectoral employment work that, that Larry has been talking about. But at the core, I don't feel like this conversation. Can, when I think about it from the 
the disconnect between the labor market that is still demanding more skilled people, and we, we could talk about AI and how that may change, but at this moment, you still need kind of more education to get a good job. How do we prepare more people uh, towards that? I think we also haven't made much progress on another thing that is kind of very top of mind for me. Well, hold on, hold on. Oh. I'm going to pause well, you. I'm yeah. going to pause you. One of the things that you, and Marianne and I had several background conversations in advance yeah. of this. One of the things that you talked about in our background conversation that I thought was really interesting was that 30 years ago, when you started your career, so what's the math on that? 1993. Um, <laughs> there was this assumption, you said, oh. that people should not be given money. Oh, I'm going to get there. I was going to get there. OK. I just surprised, I just wanted to surprise you a little bit, which is like, you know, uncanny okay. a little okay. bit. All right. So I'm going to get there. I just, the other thing on, on, this, on this path is just the other place where I think we haven't made much progress is just the educational imbalances between boys and girls. And I think that ties back to a lot of other conversations that I think are relevant to the, the poverty conversation, right? The, the fact that there are too many African-American men that you know, kind of are not succeeding at school and hence not succeeding in the labor market and the implication this has for like, you know, family formation and all of that, which is very, very important to the conversation about poverty. Now I'm going to go to what you wanted to uh, talk about. So I think the, the other thing that I've been you know, thinking about is just that you know, I was in grad school in 1993. Welfare reforms is 1996. And that was certainly very meaningful. Now, I came from Belgium. I had no idea. We just talked about I still don't know the difference between Medicaid and Medicare. I really didn't understand anything about you know, FDC, food stamps, and all that, all that jazz. But I think that was certainly a very important moment where I think people felt that, at the time, somewhat based on research, also based on very strong narrative, like Charles Murray's you know, narrative that you know, we should not be giving people money, that they're going to waste it, they're going to drink it, they're going to just you know, kind of use it for drugs. We should not be giving money. And we really made this switch as a country to make the welfare system conditional, you know, conditional on work. Now, I think what's I think striking about this to me is that we're talking about making a welfare system conditional on work in an environment where finding good work is just really hard based on all that I've, you know, that I've said before. So I feel like we've, I think, changed our views over this particular question over the last 30 years. I think my sense that there are more kind of economists in the room right now that feel like these welfare reforms were Maybe they encouraged some people to get to work, but I think it became very clear that for a subset of people, finding work was just not going to be an option. And these reforms, I think, have really increased poverty for a set of people for, for whom kind of finding, finding work was just not, uh, not in the cards. And, and I think, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that I think there's been an obsession. You know, economists like to measure kind of labor supply responses, you know, disincentive effects. And I think a lot of these welfare reforms were kind of because we believe that these, you know, you know, if you just give people money, they'll just stop working. And I feel like a lot of the evidence that has accumulated over the last, you know, two or three decades, again, a lot of the work kind of coming from this room and applying kind of, you know, the RCT methods is telling us that when you give, you know, people don't have a lot, some cash, kind of maybe some of them are going to work a little bit less, but not of the magnitudes of labor supply responses that I think many people anticipated. So that, that I think is true. And then the other thing before kind of you, you come in that I really want to, that we want to stress is that I feel like we've learned because of our data and because of our willingness to kind of like evaluate programs, not just in terms of the imme immediate impacts, but really taking stock of like what happens to the next generations, I think we've learned that this cash that we give to people really makes a big difference for the children. And I think that is, if you think about the one area where I've, I think we've seen, and I've done no work in this area, but like documenting how when you assist parents, the kids are gonna do better. Their health is gonna be better. Their education is gonna be better. The labor market outcome is gonna be better. I think that has taken some patience. That has taken lots of great data. But I feel like we know that now, and we feel, feel much more comf comfortable with this, uh, this, this, this conclusion. So I, I, I want to go back, though. I want to sl slow down. Yeah. <laughs> Giving people money will lead to them stopping work. In 1993, did you think that? 
Why, and, and, and why, why did that, that was a well-held belief. Why did people who were well-meaning, not hateful people think this thought? Well, I think there was some data that suggested, especially when you have a poorly designed welfare system, which was kind of, I think, the case before, where you know, for every extra dollar that you earn, you lose one dollar of like kind of welfare support. Lots of reasonable people facing a system like that are going to make rationally some decisions to you know not work as hard. So I think it was also kind of a problem of a poorly designed kind of welfare system pre you know pre TANF, but then we moved to TANF that really left a lot of people that were unable to work you know with essentially no cash, like no no support system. Do you think TANF helped people in the U.S. at least understand what the impact would be? That, that you needed to actually, taking, taking, making work a condition of financial support, did that help advance how people thought about and understood what solutions to poverty could be? Well, I mean, I think making it, you know, kind of making kind of some receiving and support conditional work got some people to start working that would not have worked otherwise, especially given the strong disincentive that were built in the prior system, but also left on, you know, on the side a bunch of people for whom kind of work was just not even, you know, kind of not even possible. That's the main thing that I was trying to stress. And for, for you, just you, using you, this, this is such a huge topic, right? I'm trying to understand like how, the, the evidence in and around poverty, and just using you as, as the no. sort of facsimile for us. In 1993, if you, had to, if you were forced to say yes, it, the, you know, uh, giving people money, they'll stop working, what would you have said? Um, I don't think that we had, you know, kind of all of the evidence that we have, you know, that we have right now. And again, when I, when I think about this question, I'm, I'm mainly relying on a lot of studies, you know, RCTs, Lots of them are not yet in the U.S., but lots of them are going on in the U.S. right now, kind of thinking about just unconditional cash transfers, where people have been really able to measure, you know, the labor supply responses to these cash transfers and finding, you know, some minimal kind of reduction, you know, in, in work. And I think, it, I think another way to put about it, to, to think about it is that the models that we have in economics, these very simplified models of what make, make people happy, always assume that what people want to do is just basically sit around and watch TV all day and, you know, kind of not work. And I think work is... You know, I think for most people, part of what defines them, and this is where I think a lot of these models kind of got it wrong when you know, kind of they they predicted that these labor supply responses would be so much higher when you give people when you give people cash. Is there so so when between 1993 and 2000 was there any evidence or 2005, 2010? Was there a, a moment in time when there was new evidence that came on the scene that really helped challenge this assumption? I don't know, I can't, I know you want me to point at particular papers, but I don't think I have one paper that comes to mind. Maybe some of the other people in the room have, you know, kind of one paper that comes to mind, but I don't, I don't have that. So, but are there, is there, what, what sorts of, I, what I'm really asking is what sorts of experiments, what, what, bege, what did people begin to do? What sorts of policies were enacted that began to shift the narrative? Yeah, well, I mean, again, so RCTs, some of these kind of were kind of pilot programs where you know some states are starting doing some things differently. I think the best evidence that we have on what happens when you give people cash comes for like randomized control trials, such as the one that you know kind of you know people within you know kind of the JF organization have been doing in you know various parts of the world, and and many of these kind of pilot type of pilots are going on right now you know in the U.S. where we'll have kind of more you know even more kind of robust answers for the U.S. Right, and I'm just curious. Let's just, just take a like a, a quick poll of, uh, in the audience. At any point in your life, not necessarily today, but raise your hand if at one point you actually did think, oh, if you if if you know lots of I, I don't know about you guys. I certainly have family members who would think like, oh yeah, people on welfare they don't work. Raise your hand if you've actually had that sort of thought at some point in your life, or if. One and, and two and and what about what about have, has heard who in this room has heard oh. that sentiment articulated before? Yeah. Okay. And um. And I was, go ahead. I was going to add something. So I think you pointed at something else because when I. 
when I thought about the answer to the question, I think there are at least two other areas of, of change that I feel like I've, I've witnessed over the last, you know, over the last 30 years when thinking about poverty. And one is related, maybe that was, that's not the right one to start with, but like with the idea of a culture of poverty, right? Where it's a very lauded expression that seems to be tied up to exactly the question you ask, right? People are poor because they're just lazy and you know, they don't apply themselves. And I feel like there's been a bit of a revival of a literature and a research you know, agenda on culture of poverty, but not in that such loaded of a, of a term. But what I'm trying to say with that is that there's some exciting work that's going on that is trying to help us understand why, you know, kind of, if you give people, you know, access to the same set of support and services and resources, some people are going to make more out of them than others. And I think there's a really exciting research agenda that is about trying to understand that. So you asked me for specific studies. This is one where like one came, kind of one came to mind. Um, we have this colleague at Chicago, uh, Leo Bernstein, that has done a bunch of like, I think really, really nice kind of field experiments really using our cities. One that I particularly like is uh, something they did a while back in um, the LA public schools where um, all the kids at the LA public schools, poor schools, kind of fairly Hispanic heavy um, environment, were offered free access to uh, SAT prep classes, right? Just free access to the classes. And when he gets offered the same, you know, the same, um, the same benefits, when he found that these young kids' willingness to take up these benefits varied a lot based on whether or not the classmates observed they were signing up for them. Right? The idea that some kids might be living in environments, cultures, wherever these cultures come from, wherever these norms come from, where the idea of trying to be studious, trying to apply yourself, may be something that may backfire for you. Right? I think that is a version, I think, of when we think about in terms of culture of poverty that is way more elevated than just poor people are lazy and that's why they're poor, but get us thinking about how things like norms, like identity and all of that may prevent some people from you know, kind of taking up things that are being offered to them to try to help them out. I think another version of that is when I think about trust, right? So I'm in Chicago. You know, kind of, there's so little trust in institutions on the south side of the city for reasons that are very understandable, right? But once you deal with an environment where people don't trust the government, they don't trust these offers, then they don't take them up, right? And I think we really need to, to do more in this area. And that's, that's something that's actually closer to my own kind of research interest, but I think really important. So I think it's a revival of thinking about culture when it comes, when it comes to poverty, but a much more, uh, uh, a view that is much more grounded in, you know, psychological research, social psych research, which I think is, is really kind of really important. And what, and Marianne, what do you think has sort of like broken that open? Why is there sort of a greater level in your mind? Why is there, at least yeah. in research circles, why is there a greater I level of se sensitivity, humanity and compassion? Yeah. yeah, I think it's because economics has changed more broadly and that's, in the sense that goes back to, that, that's going to get to my, my, my third point is that I think we have How become, many points do you have, I have by three. The way? I, Just three? I surprise Are you, you sure? I surprise okay, you. Okay, okay. I surprise you. I think that we are way more open to other social sciences than we were when I went to grad school. I think we have become better as a field whose goal is really to understand why people make the decision that they do by, you know, kind of moving beyond all simple, rational models and allowing for the possibility that people make decisions not just to maximize, you know, leisure minus whatever, kind of whatever is that utility function, but that people have other things that, you know, kind of drive them, right? So just what you're gonna think of me, you know, kind of how I think about myself, how my parents kind of uh, raise me and what kind of self-image I have and that matters. We think we're much more accepting as, econom as a profession for the better of like these other ways to think about what drives people's decision making. And I think the, the success for economics has been that I think we've been more open to these models and then we've taken the rigor of our methods, which where I think we are still kind of the best of the social sciences and um, to test, you know, to test these ideas. And that was gonna be my third point. I think behavioral economics, I think is the other thing that's highly different 
you know, kind of 1993, I mean, obviously Dick Thaler is already there and Danny Kahneman, but it's really kind of that generation of people that, you know, kind of really took seriously these kind of the ideas that people make mistake, they make mistakes in a way that is systematic, and really thought about, okay, so that has implications, and has implications for, for poverty as well. Do you, do you remember at any point in your career, as, the, as this sort of shift happened, being, because, because there was sort of greater humanity, greater compassion, greater understanding that the, the, some of these like clumsy theories that we have, mm -hmm. like all people are sort of lazy, they just want to sit on the couch, as that sort of dissipated, did that open the door for you? Were you able to ask other sorts of questions in and around poverty or related as a labor economist that you could, all of a sudden you just felt like you could go yeah. farther faster? I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think just more freedom around, you know, kind of around methods. So one could say maybe too many degrees of freedom to explain the world, right? So not the Occam's razor, which I think lots of economists really like because I don't need to rely on X, Y, and Z to explain behavior. But, you know, if I think X, Y, and Z gets us closer to the way people make decision, you know, I think we should look at X, Y, and Z, even if it makes for like not as simple and straightforward models to understand the world. But can you give us a story? Can you tell us a, a story of something that you were able, at, as things opened up, what's an example, a concrete example of something you were able to do that you couldn't have done in a more narrow, limited time? Um, in terms of my own work? Or it doesn't um, have to I be. You can cite somebody else's if you think that's better. No, I it's mean, fine. Just, again, it's not related to poverty, but I think the way, you know, kind of the work I've done on gender, I think kind of has been very much, you know, trying to see how, could, how far you could go by explaining, you know, kind of gender inequality, you know, kind of by being kind of more understanding about, you know, kind of what drives people's, you know, kind of decision, identity, and, and all of that. So, yeah. Going to the next question mm -hmm. here. Um, you've said in the past that in 2023, policymakers have all the evidence they need to meaningfully address poverty. They know what to do, but they don't do it. What's an example of this? Uh, I don't know if did I, did I say that to you in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just you, to you in the past. No, no it, was right. on, it was on our call. Yes, okay. it was right. on our that call. Was, not so long ago. You, you were, I'm, not, I'm, not, I, I'm not referring to the New Dan York Times quote. I think what Dan, what Dan is referring to here is that I think it's just a huge amount of frustration, and that's a bit of like the arc of like my own kind of 30 years of like, you know, kind of doing this job where it's, I didn't say that we have all the answers, but I think there are things that I feel like we know, right? You just, you know, if you don't spend money on helping people, you're not going to go anywhere, whether it's like more money for tutoring, you know, kind of uh, more support for like, you know, single mothers. And so I think the latest example of this was certainly what happened with, you know, the child tax credit, right? So it was just incredible. We had this experiment, it happened because of COVID, and we decided that we're gonna just help families whether or not they earn anything, whether or not they have, you know, kind of job and support the kids in these families. And that cut the child poverty rate by 30%, 40%, right? Now, I'm not saying this was the cheapest policy, it was $100 billion, but it made a huge difference. Yet, we were unable to keep this conversation going. We were unable to get Congress to agree that, you know, yes, child poverty is important, we know how to cut it, we know how to address it, we should do something about it. And I think that's where you kind of ask yourself, on the one hand, the kind of work that we all do in this room, it's great, but this is not only like a, a very small fraction of the battle because, you know, you find that something works, that's very different than getting Congress to go and say we're going to be doing this at scale. And, and I think when you get to those questions, I think what comes to mind is more like political economy. Like why are these people in government doing the things that they do? I mean, the context of child tax credit was pretty clear. There was a huge amount of lobbying by, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, kind of um, among other things to try to kind of um, not, um, you know, kind of not go ahead with, uh, with this. So I think kind of the arc is more, this often kind of, I feel a lot of frustration that I have with like, you know, we make progress, we understand things, but then you're only just a very small amount of the way towards, you know, actu actually getting change at scale. 
you know, kind of turning these insights into, uh, into policy. And I think there's no way you can understand that without understanding the political economy of, you know, of decisions. So like Gustavo is one of the other person here that he does a bit of the, you know, kind of applied micro work that I do, but I think also has interest in political economy. I think that we might be doing both of those things for the same reason. If, if, you, could, if you could sort of put together a PowerPoint presentation for Congress around, around, the, <laughs> around what we've learned about poverty yeah. and how to address poverty. Well, I mean, I think my PowerPoint presentation. What's the, what's the, let me what, just finish no. the question. Yeah. What, what, what's the, what's the okay. number one data point right. you would try I would bring, to get? I would bring the executive summary of um, Nathan Hendren's paper that was actually discussed earlier today, where what Nathan did in that paper is take like hundreds of like kind of programs, whether the education program, cash transfers, a range of things like tax reforms and trying to very seriously take the results of these papers to try to tell you what's the cost benefit on this. He has, doesn't use cost benefit, he has on the concept, but the bottom line is that this is a paper in this, a figure in this paper that is striking, which is basically like all of these programs, not all of them, but the majority of the programs that are targeted towards children, they pay for themselves. They more than pay for themselves. They are investment. You put the money, and if you are patient enough, which Congress may not be, that's the other part where it gets interesting. If you're patient enough, it's going to pay back for itself. You invest in these families. The kids get healthier. They get more schooling. They get more income, and that gives more tax revenue to the government. I think that would be, you know, if you tell me to bring only one slide, I would just bring that figure from, um, from Nathan's work. And I would cite Nathan. And, 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 <laughs> and that was not known in 1993? That was not known in 1993. I think most of the programs, that's a good question, actually. I would say that the majority of the programs that are in Nathan's paper are more recent than that. They're probably like, you know, kind of more recent, yeah, more recent research. And, and Still really anchoring on this 1993. Well, it? I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I, I can only imagine what kind of green colored <laughs> pants you'd wear in 1993. Um, I think what I'm fascinated by is, is, is how in 1993, what you just said couldn't have been said, and what you just said can be said now, and yeah, the reason well, I mean, it can it be said is because it's data, right? Yeah, there's data, and it requires some, some patience. I mean, another perfect example of this is the, the Moving to Opportunity Project. I think we were, I think probably in grad school, the Moving to Opportunity Project is like you give people vouchers to move to better neighborhoods. I think we were all in grad school when this was happening, and the results were extremely disappointing. I mean, they found improvement in mental health for you know, moms, but that was basically it, nothing in terms of jobs. And it took two decades, probably, for them to then be able to track the kids that were able to move to these kind of better neighborhoods and realize that, gosh, these kids are doing so much better. So it required data, right? All these data linkages that, um, People talking about a break, I don't remember. Like they really, really make a huge difference, and and time and patience, unfortunately. Um, yeah. I want I want I want to go back to this this thing you said earlier about trust. Yep. You said that building establishing trust is really important, and as we all know, I mean we're we're here tonight, like having this lovely. Oh, I missed that. How ten minutes. What's ten minutes. Thanks. Um, <laughs> just doing this all night. Uh, there are lots of people tonight all across this country who are struggling who are suffering. And part of it, as you were saying, is because there's a lack of trust. Even if there are programs designed to try to be helpful and useful, what have you learned through your research about engendering trust with people who are marginalized and prone to be mistrustful for good reason? I don't know that I've learned that much about that. I'm very aware of it. You know, I'm very aware of it in the context of, you know, I, I run this, this lab in, in Chicago. I'm, I'm very aware that a lot of the people that are part of the programs that we, you know, that we evaluate, you know, kind of don't like to be part of these evaluations, you know, kind of and don't, have the, don't have the trust. So I'm aware of it. I don't know that I've learned much. I think the, you know, one area where I think that, you know, kind of we've learned something is the work that I think Marcella is coming tomorrow. Right, Marcella is coming tomorrow talking about healthcare, which is, I think, an area where there's also low level of trust 
among you know, communities of color in the healthcare system. And I think Marcella's work shows that you can make a big difference by you know, trying to kind of have you know, kind of doctors that are kind of the same groups, you know, kind of serving patients. So there, there are things that we know we can change, but increasing trust, increasing trust in institutions, all that is, is, is really complicated. I wish I had a better answer. I don't, I don't have one. Right, and so when you think, when you talk about, you know, trying to address poverty, on the, on the one hand, there's the child tax credit story. There's this idea yeah. that if you can get money to low-income yeah. people and give them money, that will be useful. But it sounds like you're also saying part, your, your suspicion is that you, that wouldn't be enough in and of itself. If you were really gonna kind of like, and this is overstating it, yeah. but eradicate poverty in the yeah. United States. No, I, I, I agree with that. I think the other thing that I feel like we've learned, and I'm looking at you know, people from Leo over there, this kind of great organization in Notre Dame, I think we have also more and more evidence that programs that are kind of wraparound, that you know, support people, with the money, but also provide you know other kind of you know other source of support like counseling, tutoring, mentoring. That these programs you know kind of tend to be kind of more kind of more effective. So, yeah. Nineteen ninety three. Yeah, nineteen ninety three. That's right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What did you? What 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 show did you you you? No. Um, <laughs> the Simpsons. Uh, <laughs> I learned about the Simpsons. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for the researchers, the budding younger researchers yeah. in the room, who share your deep interest in reducing poverty? What what are what advice do you have, and what are one or two questions you would encourage them to explore? Okay. I mean. First, you are in the right room. This is a great organization to be connected with if you're interested in you know, addressing poverty, for sure. I think that the one thing that I would highlight is, is a bit of the tensions that we face in academia between an objective function, which is to get tenure and get papers published in the best journal, and doing work that is about trying to make a difference, and these, unfortunately, do not always, you know, overlap. Um, there's a, journals, I think, tend to value work that is fancier, uh, and very often kind of the questions that policymakers are trying to answer where we can use our skills to try to help them may not be the, the kind of fancy questions that would land your papers in top journals. And I think, that's, I think that's a really hard kind of tension to face, especially when you're dealing with, you know, kind of a junior faculty member. So, you know, my advice would be, if you're like a junior faculty member really interested in making a difference, you know, kind of try to at least create like, you know, a little kind of time to work on things that will be practical, building this relationship with these amazing organizations like the one that are in the room today, to just see more of that, you know, kind of high impact work that you may have decided to go in economics for at the beginning, but realize may not always be aligned with, you know, kind of um, getting tenure at the most, you know, at MIT. Do you like the choices and decisions that you made? Do you feel like you did a good balance of pursuing the fancy stuff versus also having impact? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Say more. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, um, I think I try, I, at least I'm trying to, you know, I think this, this organization that, you know, kind of I've had the chance to be a part of um, Chicago, the Inclusive Economy Lab, I think is, is really kind of trying to, to do more of the high impact work, trying to, you know, kind of not just be the researcher doing a helicopter drop on an organization because they think they're going to be able to get a, a great paper out of it, but really trying to nurture these longer term relationships with, with partners and helping them answering the questions. So I think that part of my life now, which has been, I think, growing for the last six, seven years, is my attempt to try to kind of create this balance. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and back to the question about mm. for, for, re, for young researchers, what are, as far as you can see, given some of the political economy challenges that you referred to earlier, given the reluctance 
that exist, the kind of political realities, in, at least in this country, what are questions you would encourage people to ask? Research questions, I mean. Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of questions that may not be your standard, you know, kind of poverty question, but like getting political institutions to work better, getting people to vote, getting um, the right kind of people to run for office. Um, these are things that you can do on the ground, like, you know, by volunteering for your favorite, you know, organization, but these are also questions that as researchers, I think we can, you know, we can think about and make progress on. So I think that that would be kind of where I would work, right? So I think one of the reasons that, you know, kind of, you know, this, this country spends a lot of money on social welfare, just not so much towards the poor. You know, we give a lot of money to all the people. We give a lot of money to people that vote. Um, you know, young people, maybe not voting as much. The unborn certainly don't vote. Um, so we need to try to find ways to get the voices of the people whose, whose needs are not currently met by government to be amplified. And, you know, voting is one of them. Very good. Uh, we, have, we have about four or five minutes uh, audience questions. I don't think there's a microphone here. So if you have a question, please uh, stand up. Oh, we do have a microphone. Awesome. Stand up and introduce yourself so everybody can know who you are. And please keep your question short. <laughs> I'll try. I'm Carrie Chihawk. I'm from King County Government. And um, I guess my question is, <laughs> is about how we shift from talking about norms and culture, individual initiative, to the structural conditions that are really contributing to putting people in poverty and in fact keeping them there. And I think that's a responsibility both of us as we're trying to build really strong RCT evidence that in most cases is built on you know, individual level data, but it's also the responsibility of journalists and helping us talk about that in the bigger structural sense. Because I feel like as a, you know, in government, as we're trying to push towards um, taking on more risk to reduce the barriers for people to participate in benefits that they deserve, um, there's also always this attack back about the waste, fraud, and abuse in the system, right? So, and let me just what what yeah. hit, hit the question because I the, just want to the make question sure is how do we sh how do how do we create the narrative change from one of individual responsibility to the structural conditions that are leading to Great. the problems that exist for people? Thank you. That's you. That's on me. <laughs> there was a question for you. You are the journalist, so yeah. you you write the narrative. Uh, well, but I think, but you you are the <laughs> you're the researcher, and you kind of create the data, and I report on the data that you you create. I know this is this is such a such a hard yeah. Joint this is such a such a hard question. Um, I I yeah. I don't have I don't have the answer to the question. What I, what I, what I will say it's a very small part I think of your question, but so. If I think about the evolutions that has happened over the last four or five years in the way economists think about um, barriers to like say racial equity, right? The way we think about discrimination. I'm bringing this up because you, you, brought, you brought this in your, in your remark earlier. I feel like we've we finally caught on to models that really help us think about, you know, the systemic barriers, rather than just our old school models of like, we need to have like races in the system to explain why, you know, kind of people of color are not doing as well. We understand, I think, much better now that, you know, kind of, they might be barriers to success for people of color absent anybody discriminating the system just because of the history that we went through. So my hope is that the fact that now we as a profession can think better about, you know, kind of this other way to think about kind of discrimination will, 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 will make a difference 
you know, kind of, kind of going forward in the kind of solutions or approaches that are being presented? I, it's not a great answer, but that's all I can give you. My, my answer is the journalist, and it is, I, I didn't realize that that's also partially directed to, to me, but in as much of it as it is, um, you know, we have a podcast, trade-offs, and it's uh, 200 episodes in, and we, we talk about being at the intersection of policy, money, and people. And what I've learned as a journalist over 20 years is there's, there's a lot of skepticism about whatever you're going to say, and one way or the other. And so the, the, the two antidotes I've identified for me in my work to try to not persuade people, but to preserve them keeping an open mind is to combine data and evidence. I'm not just saying that because I'm at j -PAL. I'm really not. <laughs> um, data is really important. That's why I kind of keep coming back to the 93 thing, because like how we think about data and evidence, and it changes and it shifts, and marking that and talking about that and giving that a prominent role is important in my journalism. But then you have to pair it. it that's, that in and of itself is not enough. It also has to be the voices of people. And when you combine those voices, because it's very easy to say, oh, some economists, that's a bunch of, I was about to swear. Amy, I didn't swear. Um, uh, oh, these economists, that's a bunch of BS. Uh, but when you pair the data with somebody's voice who's yeah. cracking and quavering, and they're talking about struggling to feed their child, and you can then interview the child, and they're talking about how they lived in the tent, over the summer in New Hampshire, northern New Hampshire, it's a different deal. You have to take it more seriously. I mean, not everybody's going to, but it's harder to dismiss that combination. Um, okay, we are, we have four minutes. One more question, two more questions. And just stand up and introduce yourself. The microphone's coming. Sure, um, Allison, uh, RIP Medical Debt. I just, more on this theme of evidence versus narrative. And which one do you think influences policy more? And I, I particularly want to know about your thoughts about the move from AFDC to uh, TANF, and which you like, you know, the trade-offs that were made, and yeah, I think you know, what was real. I, my, my sense at the time, the narratives were extremely powerful. Um, you know, this is we really don't have expertise in narrative in our profession. I think this requires some more teamwork. I think we're good at data. I don't think we're good at narratives. At least I'm not good at narratives. No, but, most economists are not But good. I very much <laughs> agree with you. I agree with you that for change, you know, kind of being able to write these narratives, that's the whole communication goal. I mean, in the sense of Japan, you guys do a lot of that, right? I mean, maybe that's a good question about how we, you know, how we go ahead um, and, uh, and do it. But yeah, narratives are super, super powerful, and, and they take a hard time to go away. I mean, oh, Poor people are poor because they're lazy. I, 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 let me, I have an amazing story about narrative. And, and, and I, I covered the New Hampshire State House, which was the fourth largest legislature in the English speaking world. 400 members, they're all volunteers, get paid $200 plus, plus mileage a year. And um, don't have any staff. Like people will show up in their flip flops. Like, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty interesting scene. And uh, there's going to be a vote on the House floor that morning to uh, reinstitute the death penalty. And this guy, this state rep from the Seacoast, which is the more liberal part, Rennie Pelletier, comes up to the well and he starts talking. Mm. And Rennie Pelletier in the late 70s, I think, maybe early 80s, his parents were killed and at gunpoint, randomly, it was a horrific thing it had made. And, but most of the people in the room had known this story. And he was pleading, pleading with the people in the room, don't vote to reinstitute the death penalty. This happened to me. Me and my siblings, we didn't want the death penalty. Don't do it. And that morning, the House was definitely going to vote for the death penalty to reinstitute it, and they didn't. And they didn't because of Rennie Pelletier's story. Mm -hmm. That is the power of narrative. And this, yeah. is, this was a conservative law about they, they wanted to, and there was not a dry eye in the yeah. room. The, pro the problem though with narratives is that yeah. I totally understand that they are, they are the thing that convinces people. But very often, the data leads you to its narrative that are very complicated. 
and they're not going to be catching on and you have to fight with these like complicated narratives with the simpler ones that, and, and that's, that's very difficult. The one other thing that I will say on this is That's that, why our podcast is called Trade-Offs. You know, I mean, I'm, like, I, yeah, I understand. Okay. Like, I mean, like, I that is, listen, that, I should that, listen that, more. That, that is, no, but no, 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 I don't mean, I don't mean it that way, but like that, no, no, that's right. It, it, this is very, this but the one is thing, nuanced. I know we're out of time. The, yeah. the one thing that I will say on this, though, is that I think the power, in the, in the work that we do now um, in Chicago, I think we're trying more and more to combine data with qualitative work. We are not expert at qualitative work. We, you know, Hard people are not economists to do these things, but I think the combination of like you know kind of strong data-based causal evidence with stories like I mean one of my favorite academic in the world is like Catherine Eden, she knows more than I will ever know about poverty, and she she writes these very powerful stories, and there's a amazing kind of combination between that kind of scientific quantitative work and the kind of like more ethnographic storytelling that, you know, that she does. And I think we should do more of that because they build those stories. Well, and, and maybe as to, to sort of wrap this up, you've talked about how much the field of economics has evolved in just these past 30 years. Perhaps this is another part of the evolution. Uh, you all have been amazing. Thank you. Let's give it up for Mary Ann, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Marianne, for that great fireside chat. You gave us a lot to think about, and we're also going to be thinking about the year 1993 a lot after that conversation. So this wraps up uh, day one of our event. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Tomorrow morning, breakfast will begin at 8.15 a.m., and the conference will officially kick off at 9 a.m. with opening remarks from j North America's co-scientific director, Amy Finkelstein. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you all have a good night. See you tomorrow morning.